Okay, well, this is Mary Eileen, if you want to introduce yourself. Good morning, and we certainly are welcoming you. We've got Mr. Sunshine out just as bright as he can be, and this is the third Sunday in Lent. So uh, with that, we will start. Uh, Mary Eileen will give a little thing of, her, of, what, of who she is and where she's from and all that at another time. But we are glad to have her, that's for sure. I told her, otherwise one of us would have had to figure out something, and that, that's very difficult. 
Okay, well, we need to welcome you all. We welcome the people who are at home listening. And um, you're always welcome to come into the congregation here anytime you want to come. Okay, well, our <coughs> prayer concerns are huge. And I read somewhere that some woman said that she, when she prayed for them, <coughs> she would just lay her hand on the bulletin and pray for the people who are lifted up for concern. So that might be something you might want to try. Uh, <coughs> we have no birthdays. And anniversaries are March the 3rd, our Don and Marty priests, and it's 52 years. And Mike and Janet Shipley is the 5th, and it's 59 years for them. So we're just... <clears throat> okay, make sure that you sign the greeting cards. They're for Steve Richmond, Don and Marty priests, and Jeanette Rosemont. And, I, you know, I think... Anytime you get a little piece of mail in that uh, can lift your spirits. So make sure that you take a moment and sign those. Um, and then our pastor this morning is Reverend Mary Eileen Spence. And she has a little <coughs> biography she'll give you. Church Women United is still going. It's 1.30 on uh, Christ Lutheran Church. And it is on Mondays. And then we have, uh, I think, the collection sale, the collection site for the Faith Foster may be concluded the end of, of February. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, and it says, don't forget to spring your, lock, your clocks ahead one hour for next Sunday morning. So uh, if you look at the weekly calendar, you can look at it and... Uh, let me lift something up. I want to make sure people who are in circle, charity circle, remember it's at 6 o'clock this Wednesday in the parlor. And Thursday we will have another information session about the KUO thing. And uh, last time I think it was very informative. There were lots of questions, which was good. It means people are thinking. Um, and we just need to realize probably none of our, well, maybe not none of them, but there's going to be people, or there's going to be things that we have done in the past that are not going to be able to take place. So we need to understand that it's for the better good uh, and be willing to let go of a few things. But we will have an opportunity to minister to a number of children that we probably... Pastor Sunita pointed out, when would we ever have the opportunity to be a part of this many children's lives? So let's keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> okay. Now, if you will stand and pass the peace, peace be with you. So please share the peace of God. today is Are You Able on page 530.
join me in the opening prayer. In this season of Lent, O oh God, prompt us to reevaluate our spiritual lives. We would worship you sincerely, follow you carefully, and grow in grace and holiness. May we be bold in our faith and daring in Christian service to the end that your name be honored on earth in, as as in heaven. Hear our prayer in our Savior's name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, our New Testament lesson today is from 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but it's the power of God for those of us who are being saved. It is written in scripture, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will reject the intelligence of the intelligent. Where are the wise? Where are the legal experts? Where are today's debaters? Hasn't God made the wisdom of the world foolish? In God's wisdom, he determined that the world wouldn't come to know him through his wisdom. Instead, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of preaching. Jews ask for signs and Greeks looked for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, which is a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. This is because the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human health. Holy words and holy wisdom. Thanks be to God. The reflection song is page 292. What wondrous love is this?
Well, hopefully I won't lose this mic. Good morning. I am... Good morning. I should give you the opportunity to respond. Um, I am Pastor Mary Eileen Spence. I am a retired elder in the United Methodist Church. Um, I live in Noblesville, Indiana. That's where my husband and I retired to. I did serve in the Northern Conference, and in fact, I was in the Logansport area for 18 years. Um, ended my ministry in South Bend and said, I'm not staying here where there's 100 inches of snow. Um, although they haven't had that this year like the rest of us. I have um, three children, seven grandchildren. Uh, my husband, Don, is a financial consultant, and he's still working part-time. As I am on staff um, at Noblesville First United Methodist Church as a pastoral care pastor. So I have not quite fully retired, um, but the caveat is when I want to be gone, I get to be gone. So that, that was the thing if I was going to do um, uh, a, a, a paying um, job for the church. Um, it is good to be with you here today. I hope that sincerely your pastor has had a good R&R. &R. It looked, sounded like she was going to be something that was very much fun. And um, I've never done a, a cruise, but maybe one of these days. Maybe one of these days. So once again, it's a joy to be with you today. And so as we come to this time of the pastoral prayer, I would ask that we would spend a few moments in silent reflection to lift up our own personal needs to God, and then I will do the pastoral prayer, and at the end we will recite the Our Father together. Let us go to God in prayer. In this season, loving and merciful God, we are reminded with the beginning of each new day, we are given the opportunity to start anew. For this we are thankful, lifting up our praise and gratitude for the ways you continually remain steadfast to us in our comings and goings, especially when we need you the most but turn to you the least. You were still there. You walked with us when we did not call upon you. You guided us in our need when we did not ask you to do so. And so, O oh God, we are thankful. And we pray, O oh God, that you continue to help us to be more aware of your presence and the way you fulfill our needs throughout the course of our days. Provident God, we pray your Holy Spirit gives us an awareness of your presence that emboldens us to be more fully yours in all that we do. Remind us that your abundant grace always meets us in our need and is always what we need, even when we think not. Remind us that your abundant grace allows us to meet the needs of others even when we feel we cannot as we place our trust in you to lead us in such times. Because of this, we pray comforting God for your steadfast presence to be with those 
who are in much need of your care. There are many that are listed in this bulletin, O God. You know their needs. I would ask that your comforting arms of love be wrapped around those who have the need and those who care for them. Give them strength. Give them healing. Whatever it is that they may need, may they know your touch. And may those that care for them know your strength and have wisdom and discernment to know how best to care for them. Holy and merciful God, we thank you for the gifts of the season of Lent, which call us to slow down and quiet ourselves that we might hear your voice in the stillness. May your Holy Spirit communion more fully with us as we examine our hearts and lives, taking stock of our relationship with you and others as we discern our fears and whatever holds us back, keeping us from giving ourselves more fully to your service in all the ways that we can. As we do, reach out to be your disciple in this world. In this Lenten season, O oh Lord, we give thanks for your free gift of grace, revealed fully to us in your life here on earth, showing us the way to be your people. We are filled with gratitude for your sacrificial love of dying on the cross and rising from the dead, conquering our failures that move us to faithfulness and joyful dependence upon you in our need as through us we meet the needs of others as you call us to do so. And as we meet those needs, we pray this prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now hear these words from the Gospel of John, the second chapter, the 13th through the 22nd verse. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were selling cattle, sheep, and doves, as well as those involved in exchanging currency sitting there. He made a whip from ropes and chased them all out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins and overturned the tables of those who exchanged currency. He said to the dove sellers, Get those things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it is written, Passion for your house consumes me. Then the Jewish leaders asked him, By what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous signs will you show us? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jewish leaders replied, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the word that God had spoken. This is the gospel of the risen Christ. Be 
Well, we all have hot buttons, don't we? Or maybe you prefer to call them pet peeves because you want to soften it a little bit and make it not sound so bad. I think we all like to do that in life. And you know what your pet peeves are, those things that absolutely raise up your ur and drive you crazy. And sometimes you want to jump across the table if you're a group, if you're in a group of people and you know there's that person that has the pen, keeps clicking it. Just you just want and you want to raise up and shout, would you please stop that? That's a mild one. And you know, though, those hot buttons that really raise your ur, and you actually really get angry about. There are hot button issues in our lives, whether big or small, that tend to upset us so much that we begin to feel annoyed and upset. And within, we can feel ourselves getting angry. Sometimes this anger overflows to the point that we do explode in some fashion. Sometimes with more volatility than others. If we're all honest with one another, we have a story to share about a time when one of our hot buttons pushed us to the limit, causing us to explode in anger. Now, like me, it might be hard for some of us to remember some of those stories because I think we're getting a little up there in our years. But it was a time when we just plain lost it. I know I have lost my composure in a few of life's situations. A rather common example of this is when I'm driving. This did not happen today, by the way. I consider myself a pretty laid-back person, for the most part. I work at not getting upset with other drivers. I keep praying for patience all the time. I remind myself when I get in the car that there are moments when it's going to be stressful. So I pray to God to have patience, but then there's that person, and sometime more than one, who thinks they should be allowed to go to the head of the line in the construction zones all over the Indianapolis suburban area. I'm sure you have them here in Kokomo. After a while, my hot button kicks in and I begin to become angry and upset that I, that I have followed the rules and dutifully fell into line when the sign said, move over. On the other hand, there are all of those that just keep zooming ahead until they can no longer zoom ahead, leaving those of us who have stayed in line to allow them in unless we want to cause an accident. Now, I would confess to you, there was a time when I had gotten bold and I straddled both lanes. I actually think I saw a truck driver do that once. Thus, I impeded those drivers who wanted to forge ahead without concern about the rest of us, who also had places to go and appointments to keep. When I think about this, in hindsight, I put myself and others at risk because I could have caused an accident if the person behind me had decided not to slow down or even tried to go around me on the burn, which is illegal, um, if there was still enough room. However, on that day, I viewed it as an injustice that needed 
to be confronted. After all, how fair is it that others should butt in line ahead of us who have dutifully followed the rule and fell into line? Was it the right way to confront this injustice? In hindsight, I do not believe it was the wisest decision, but in my anger, that's the decision I made. I was lucky not to have caused a crash or someone, or even more so in this day and age, for someone to pull up next to me, pull out a gun, and fire into my car, as people do these days in this age of more violence over such situations. I took a risk and put not only myself, but others at risk. Well, it appears to me in today's reading that Jesus had a hot button too, which allowed his anger to get the best of him as presented in the Gospel of John in today's reading. What Jesus did in the temple has been debated forever. Was his anger a righteous anger? Or was it anger that because he too was human, flared up due to the injustice of the situation in his mind? The way God's house was being used bothered Jesus, causing his anger to boil up, leading him to very uncharacteristic behavior. Now, some scholars believe in the concept of righteous anger, an anger that leads us to do the right thing, even if it is violent. Others believe that righteous anger should not result in violence, but instead be a motivator that leads us to properly bring about changes that matter when it comes to injustice. My stance even after sharing my story with you, is that I do stand in the latter camp of scholars. In hindsight, I did not handle my driving situation well and have not repeated that behavior. Now, this is not the only time we really see Jesus' hot button pushed to the limit. But I would like to say something about the placement of this story, which might make it more sense to us. In the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, remember the synoptic gospels are those gospels that are seen together presenting the same stories in the same sequence. In gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this story is at the end of Jesus' ministry preceding his arrest. And scholars seem to be in agreement that that's the correct placement of this event in Jesus' ministry, not at the beginning as John has placed it. For it is at this time that the Jewish authorities begin in earnest to look for a way to kill Jesus after he has annoyed them so much over the last three years of his ministry. And if we read the gospel, there are certainly other times that in his ministry, Jesus took the authorities to task, voicing his opposition sternly and rebuking them, but never did he exhibit the anger we see in today's reading. While Jesus' cracking a whip is not the image we usually conjure up of our Lord, it is nevertheless the one that the Apostle John shares with us today. Jesus was, if I might say, whip-cracking mad. In cracking the whip, Jesus drove the money changers and the animals 
used for sacrifices from the temple. Did he abuse anyone? We do not really know if any people or animals were injured, but it was a crowded place with thousands of people and animals there. So I can imagine that both people and animals may have felt a blow, but John leaves that detail out. We are left to come to our own conclusions. What I do know is that Jesus' hot button was triggered and he showed his passion for the need to clean up God's house to be a holy place and not one where business transactions should be taking place. In clearing the temple, Jesus took the risk of upsetting the temple worship system, of having available animals for sacrifice, and the correct money to pay the temple tax for those traveling to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover, the observation of the liberation of the Israelites from Egypt. One pastor put it this way when preaching this sermon to his congregation. Confronted with the busy, bustling scene in the temple courtyard, Jesus was suddenly struck by the futility of all that activity, the waste, the deception, the manipulation of God's intentions for selfish human purposes. The terminal sickness of this religious system hit Jesus in the face and lit up his hot button. Why did it light up his hot button? Because God's temple was to be a holy place, meant to be a place of prayer and worship, as Isaiah 56, 7 informs us, and that is recorded in the story in the Synoptic Gospels. Here in John, the disciples remember that it was written in Scripture that passion for your house consumes me, Psalm 69, 9. Jesus was certainly displaying his passion for God's house to be a place of worship. The theologian E.P. Sanders says, Jesus reacted instantaneously without considering the risk he might be running. Jesus was driving to bring the divine presence back to his God's house, to his father's house. The temple had become nothing more than a slaughterhouse, a trading house, and a party house. Jesus had to clean house in order to once again make room for God's spirit. Jesus was motivated by his anger. Now, I'm not here today, as you can tell, to debate whether it was righteous anger or not, because I don't think that's a question we can ever answer, and maybe that will be one of the questions I will ask when I arrive, hopefully, at the gates of heaven. And then, truly, it probably won't matter. But what did matter was it caused God, our Lord Jesus Christ to act passionately about a cause to clean up the temple. Because after all, it was in the Gentile courts where all this was taking place, not in the Jewish courts. And so the Gentiles were not afforded the opportunity to have the same opportunity that the Jewish people did. And so God, in the, God acted. Jesus acted rightfully or wrongfully so. But here is what I do know, and here is what I want us to learn out of all of this. It's not to be so angry to become violent, but rather when we become angry to channel that whip-cracking energy into making a difference in bringing about change for God's sake, 
Now, note who I said that should be for. We bring about change for God's sake, not for my sake and not for your sake. We bring about change for God's sake. And secondly, Jesus cleaned the temple out for God's sake in order that the temple would be holy as God intended. The season of Lent is all about examining ourselves as individuals and as a community of faith for the purpose of learning what clutter we need to clean out of ourselves, our temple. Remember later in the epistle, Paul says our bodies are a temple. And to also clean out our communities of faith, your place of worship, my place of worship. What do we need to clean out for God's sake? And that can mean lots of things, and this sermon would go on way too long if I shared them with you. But there are things that we need to give up as individuals and as the church in order to attract people to God, to Jesus Christ and the saving grace that he provides for us on the cross. Are we passionate about living for God and risking all for God even when we are asked to change? If so, I challenge all of us here today to look within ourselves and within our communities of faith to see what needs to be left behind in order for us in the church to become God's holy place alive, where the Holy Spirit resides again, where the Holy Spirit blows and breathes new life into all who join us in this worship. If this happened, I guarantee you, I would stake my life on it, that God's kingdom will be more fully realized here on earth as it is in heaven. And all God's people said, Oh, gracious God, we thank you that you have been with us in this worship up to this point. And I would ask that the words that I have just spoken would fall upon hearts and ears that are willing to hear so that feet and hands and mouths may speak. Open us up, show us the ways that we need to change to be more fully the disciples that you call us to be so that indeed we can transform this world and make disciples for Jesus Christ. Be with us, O oh God, as we leave this place so that we, when our anger rises up, can turn it into a passion to exude you in our lives so that our change in the world may be effective. All this we pray in your son's holy name. Amen.
We come now to that time in worship when we remember what Jesus Christ did for us. We remember that he took it upon himself because he was so passionate about our redemption and our ability to be close to God that we might have eternal life, that he reconciles himself to us and to God by his death on the cross. And that's what we come in Holy Communion to remember. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is a right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being, and you called them good. From the dust of the earth, you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, you bore up the ark on the waters, saved Noah and his family, and made covenant with every living creature on earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and on your holy mountain he heard your still, small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, when you gave him to save us from our sins. Your Spirit led him into the wilderness, where he fasted forty days and forty nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles uh, during forty days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. Now, when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent, we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Jesus Christ. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and he gave thanks to you and he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness 
of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's sacrifice for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. So we ask, O oh God, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of the bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may for the world, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until God comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. In the United Methodist Church, all are invited to the table. It doesn't matter what faith, it doesn't matter what denomination, it doesn't matter the state of your soul. All it matters is that you want to come and commune with our Lord and participate in the mystery of Holy Communion because that's what it is. It's a mystery. I don't know how God does it, but as we partake in communion with one another and with God at the table, we are empowered again, forgiven again, to leave this place in grace, in the strength of our Lord. God desires to commune with you this day so you may have that power. So come and taste how sweet.
Oh, gracious God, we thank you that you came down to be among us, to serve us. And just as you have served us this day through this communion, we thank you for that too. And may the receiving of this communion give us the strength to more boldly be your people in our world. All this we pray in your Son's holy name. Amen. This is the time that I say for the ushers to come forward, please, that we might take up our offering to show our gratitude for Christ and what he did for us. God, we pray that the gifts that we have so generously given on this day may be the gifts that are acceptable and pleasing to you. And not only the gifts of money that we give, but the gift of ourselves throughout this week ahead. We would ask that you would bless all of it to bear fruit for your kingdom, so that indeed Jesus Christ may be known and the world will become more your kingdom than ours. All this we pray in your Son's holy name. Amen.
of Christ to make the world to know the love of Christ. Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Oh, <laughs> <laughs>